Tonight on the Sunday show, Ukrainian prisoners of the Kremlin back home from captivity. Join relief for many, but will this really help bring war closer to the end? A human rights activist and a journalist's first-hand accounts. How much haste is the word of the day for Ukraine's ruling party? And how just is the allegation that they are trying to lose their opponents in dozens of motions they table in the parliament? MPs and a business expert share views. And what and who Romatsky's correspondent saw in Moscow on the day of local elections that she did not expect to see? Natalia Humanyuk reports from the Russian capital. Hello and welcome to the Sunday show, the only primetime English language television broadcast explained in the Eastern European geopolitical turmoil in detail. I'm Andrei Kulikov and uh, our guests today, or well, sort of guests, are Angelina Karakina, who is editor-in-chief of Romatske, and Alexandra Matvichuk, she is the head of the board of the Center for Civil Liberties. And uh, they both did quite a lot in order to ensure that Ukrainian prisoners are back from Moscow captivity and in order to promote this cause and to report on how this happened. So I'm really in two minds about whom to ask first. Angelina, who was reporting about this, apart from uh, her uh, civil activism, or Alexandra, who was mostly civil activist and still is, but maybe it will be Alexandra. What have journalists not told us about the arrival of Ukrainian prisoners to Brisbane yesterday? I think the journalists uh, not told us uh, that information which they didn't know. Because when we speak about process of exchange, we speak about some conditions. And the visible part of the conditions, like 35 uh, people who fly to Russia, uh, it was uh, um, clear to the public but we have no idea uh, if uh, there is some hidden part of the negotiation and how this exchange is uh, uh, framed in the most, more broader uh, context of realization of Minsk agreement. Angelina, while reporting on the arrival of Ukrainian prisoners and everything that was happening there, have you felt that you still have to leave something beyond the report? or you were telling us everything that you saw and uh, noticed? No, well, there were things that weren't actually clear to us, and this is something that Alexandra has just pointed out. Um, for example, we didn't know why certain people were on the list and the rest of the people were not on the list. For example, yesterday the Ukrainian ombudsman, uh, Lyudmila Denisova, uh, said that there are over 110 people still left in Russian and Crimean prison, prisoners. I know that the numbers are varying and maybe Alexandra has other different numbers because it's really hard to, to count and to see uh, under which... 86, for instance. 86 is, is uh, the mostly heard uh, number, but yesterday we heard this number and we were also wondering, okay, who, who is the rest uh, out of 110? And of course, why why we have seen yesterday why we haven't seen yesterday some of the people who were left uh, in Russian prisoners it is not clear to me so obviously it is also not clear to the viewers who were watching yesterday and following <clears throat> our coverage uh, other things are also not clear still and we also pointed out in our coverage yesterday we know that um, several people who came back yesterday home, they actually lost their homes in Crimea. They cannot go back to Crimea. For example, Alexinsov, Alexander Kolchenko, Vladimir Baluch, they cannot go back physically because um, we don't know what will happen there to them. And even though they have part of their families in the occupied territories, actually to me, it is absolutely not clear where, where they were gonna, gonna live. Uh, it's also one of the most important things and in terms of you know, care, yeah, really. and, and, and uh, what Angelina says points out to the fact that after, the, after securing the release of the people, you should not sort of uh, uh, lose 
uh, following them, yes, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure that the Center for Civil Liberties will be following their fates, but do you have any practical means to provide for their rehabilitation and going back into the Ukrainian system? Oh, it's a huge, huge issue because uh, on the sixth year of the war, in which we have uh, a lot of hostages, Kremlin hostages, uh, which was were taken in Russia, in occupied Crimea and Donbas, we still have no state policy about rehabilitation, medical care, uh, financial support for people who returned from captivity. And this is uh, a problem uh, which was tried to solve by previous parliament. They approved in first hearing draft of law, very poor quality, I must, uh, must be uh, clear that this uh, draft of law have uh, to be improved. Uh, but uh, I think that this current government, uh, parliament uh, has one of priority not uh, to manage all this uh, issue like uh, uh, by hand. So when there is med media intention for current moment, they provide some medical care or some f some financial assistance or something like this, but guaranteed uh, these uh, services by law and. Uh, adopted the law which provides such kind of service. And we have on Skype connection with us Natalia Humenyuk of uh, Romanska. She is currently in Moscow and she was closely following the process of uh, organizing the exchange or release from, the, uh, from her position in Moscow. Now she is uh, in the Russian capital. Natalia, what does the Russian media, what do the Russian media say about yesterday's event? So uh, that's uh, considered to be an extremely important event. That's interesting that uh, both independent, uh, but also in some way, the uh, government media put this exchange as the first step for the real peace between Ukraine and Russia. Um, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of independent media in particular points out the obvious difference which uh, was between the meeting the uh, prisoners, those people who were exchanged, because obviously more people po followed what was happening in Kiev, uh, where there were families, relatives, the president. Um, I spent lots of lots of time uh, on the ground so like at night waiting where the, where the buses with prisoners would come from Lefortovo uh, prison. Uh, there were official uh, Russian media there on the guard for a couple of weeks, like day and night shift. They were waiting not to miss this moment uh, when the bus would leave the premise. By the way, they weren't really informed whether the, uh, this release will take place. So they were really living for up to two weeks in front of the prison. Uh, and then later when we were at the airport, there was no also any guidelines. Uh, there is no way to talk to the families or to the officials. Um, the only like super celebrities of the Russian journalism like Dmitry Kisilov uh, come uh, in person to greet Kirill Vyshinsky, his colleague, uh, the journalist who was released, the Ukrainian journalist who, um, who had been also detained. Uh, by the way, none of most of the media hadn't been uh, allowed to get to the train, to the plane, to see who are those people who had arrived. Uh, and what is interesting, I saw there were, there were dozens, dozens, dozens of Russian media there. Most of them, absolute majority, didn't know anybody whom they were meeting. So just us, Ukrainian media knew a few Russian uh Russian citizens who were there, like Russian soldiers, but nobody really cared. And we really are working on that, like whether there are anywhere the, the relatives. And we definitely know that at least in case of the three uh, three um, families, the uh, the relatives of those people who kind of wa waited here in Moscow, uh, they knew, they got to know that their relatives, uh, their kids are released uh, just from the journalists who called them. Uh, and nobody had seen them. Nobody knows where they are. There is no official any press conference or something apart from the press conference Kirill Vyshinsky is gonna to uh, make this Monday. Thank you very much Natalia Humenyuk. We're back to the studio. So we have heard from Natalia Humenyuk that uh, the Russian journalists did not know much about the Russian citizens and not only Russian citizens who were 
released from Ukraine. But do we know about who went to Russia in exchange for Ukrainian prisoners? Annelina. Well, through the whole process, we were trying to see the, the, the final uh, list of, of the people who were to be exchanged. And um, it wasn't, a, never it was a case, you know, when there was uh, any official statement or any official document given officially by the security service or by the office of the president saying that these are the people and these are the reasons and th this is whom the Russians are asking for. Even in the case with Mr. Tsemokh, the, the only witness in the case of uh, MH17, still it wasn't clear up to the last point whether he will be exchanged because he was left, uh, he was released from uh, from the Ukrainian court. He said that he, he's planning to go to the back home to the occupied territories, uh, to the self-proclaimed uh, Donetsk People's Republic, and it wasn't clear whether he's going to fly back to Russia or go to Donetsk. So, no. So, the answer to your question is no. And uh, given what Alexandra uh, has already pointed out, that this process is quite closed and uh, quite was anti-public, so to say. Uh, it was really hard to understand. Not only, I mean, it's not only, and it, it's absolutely not about journalistic curiosity or something like that, or you know, a desire to be the first to break a story, something like that. We don't really understand legally what are the grounds and what are the the results later on. What will be the the legal aftermath uh, after each? If, after each exchange. So my question to Alexandra Matvichuk is, uh, what are the legal aspects of uh, this, as uh, you are a civil rights defender? And also, I remind you about the discrepancies in the figures of people who are still detained in Russia. Is it 110, 86, or maybe some other number? Uh, my answer to the first question will be very short, because the whole process is not in line with law. This exchange is not regulated by any laws or international documents or something like this. Uh, and don't ask me why Ukrainian court decided after when decision was taken on the high level to follow this decision, not to follow the rule of law, but decided to follow the decision of president. Don't ask me this question. Well, I and think that the, ask me the why answer is obvious, political feasibility. And why uh, Ukraine ex uh, returned back Ukrainian citizens, mm -hmm. not Russian, <laughs> it's exchange uh, when one Ukrainian citizen exchange for another Ukrainian citizen. So, the whole process is not lying in law, and it's very obvious that in such condition it's maybe impossible to be in line in law. And because uh, everything what was done by Russia also is not in line in law. And uh, second uh, answers, uh, in, our, in our list for current moments there is 86 people who imprisoned for political motives in Russia and occupied Crimea. I published the whole list of these people. Uh, for sure, it's uh, on the top of iceberg. We don't know the real number. Uh, and we're very curious uh, why uh, Ludmila Denisova said about 110 and whom sh she include additionally. Um, so well, we will well, ask you her. have an opportunity to ask her about this. Are I... you in close contact? No, no, we're not in close contact with current Ombudsman. Um, it's a long story why. <laughs> uh, and, but also I want to uh, stress intention that we also have more than several hundreds people who also uh, imprisoned in occupied Donbass. And uh, the whole process uh, which we discussed now w wasn't touch them. And uh, among them, there are people who are waiting for release also for several mm -hmm. years, for four or five already. It's, it's, I know it's, that it's, the sorry, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just unbelievably unlogical. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense in, in terms of law. 
why you would discuss these people in the framework of, of I don't know, bilateral talks between Zelensky and uh, and Putin, and the rest is part of the Minsk process, or whatever. Why, why do you why do you separate, and what logic you separate these people and and, and these terms? Of course, we we understand that, you know. It is the Russian logic to separate Crimea and Donbass and make it look like something could be done around Donbass still, but nothing could be done around Crimea anymore. But still, it's it's the, the people that we're talking about, and of course, it's also it's also a, a Ukrainian state position. Whether we talk about when we talk about everyone, is it really everyone? And uh, to support this idea, I would like to uh, stress your attention that among the list of released people, uh, there is only one person who was released from Crimea. Uh, all of them, mm -hmm. for current moment, spend their detention in Russia. Only Adem Bikirov was released from Crimea, and I'm, I'm totally sure that because of his very uh, dramatic health conditions that they start to be worried about his life, uh, and uh, and uh, no other Crimean Tatars weren't released in this process. I watched uh, the coverage by Hromatsky yesterday, and I know at least one very reputable radio station who used this uh, coverage. If you want to see real dramatic and touching moments, go and visit uh, Hromatsky.ua. But I also noticed uh, from my own perception that it was not the uh, video itself and even not the commentary itself that touched me most, but the stories that I heard from people who went there and saw and maybe even touched the people who came back. And Helena, what is your story? My story? Well, it's... Uh it's 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 sort of funny for me when when did I become part of the story? I'm not a part of the story. I've I've been covering um, the process of Sinsov and Kolchenka uh, in Rostov, and then I was trying to keep in touch with both of them, but mostly with Alexander Kolchenko. And of course, yesterday when we saw each other, it was quite an emotional moment. And some of the journalists, I don't know. It's also quite telling that many of the journalists didn't recognize the faces. And for example, one of the journalists from one of the channels that was recently bought by people affiliated with Mr. Medvedchuk uh, re reached uh, Alexander Kolchenko and asked him whether he is a sailor. So many of them just didn't uh, identify uh, people and they thought maybe I'm a relative or, or asking me for an interview, something like I'm not a part of, of the story, but of course, uh, emotionally, well, it was a huge... From my point of view, you huge, are. Uh, well, it, it, it was very, very um, emotional. And uh, um, as, as a journalist, I, I should say that in all this mess, because when they, um, when they went out uh, at the first moment, uh, some of the security people were trying to uh, separate journalists from the relatives and, and, and the released uh, prisoners. But at a certain point, there was a huge crowd. Everybody, everything was just messed up and everyone was ru running uh, and it was, there was no control uh, at all. And um, what, I, what I noticed, um, and I think it's, it's an interesting thing, that all the top officials were there, the ministers, the president, the people from his office. There wasn't anything official they, they made uh, out of it. So they were like, in, in the, not in the darkness, not in the shade really, but they weren't trying to, you know, become capitalize. Yeah, become part of this story right. so much, which right. they obviously are. And of course, Zelensky made a statement, things like that, but it was, it was quite humane, in my uh, in my opinion, because it was a very delicate moment. Uh, Alexandra, your personal aspect of this story. We start uh, our fighting for releasing political prisoners uh, when the war started, since uh, the occupation of Crimea, and. Um, the first uh, years, uh, people who were imprisoned, I don't know them personally. That's why I don't know personally 
people who, it, it, it's very funny, <laughs> they returned. I know in detail their story about their, their lives, cases. their cases, like uh, about, sorry, their diseases, mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, we also uh, use it in, 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 when we speak in, 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 in advocacy with top officials of different countries, uh, if they have some problems with health, but don't know them personally. And uh, I must uh, admit that when I, 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 I don't, didn't went to, to airport, I, I saw the live stream and even through the, my laptop, I must admit that it was a very emotional moment. And uh, the only problem for me is that I know very well relatives of people who, who are waiting and have a last hope that who knows, but maybe some mistake and some their relatives will also arrive that day, but, but not. My personal aspect is that I have a friend. He's a resettler or internally displaced person from Crimea. He lives now in Poltava. And for almost 18 months, we haven't been in correspondence. You know, all this sort of everyday life, everyone has his own business. But yesterday I got a letter from him and he said, if you by any chance see Oleg Sintsov, please remind him of our fleeting acquaintance back in Crimea. I presume that Angelina and Alexandra here have uh, more chances to see Oleg Sintsov. If you see him, please pass on greetings from Alexandra Andrusenko, previously of Simferopol and now from Poltava. And we're back in the studio of the Sunday show after this rather moving discussion of uh, Ukrainian prisoners coming back from Russia, coming home. We have with us in the alphabetical order James Brook, the editor-in-chief of the Ukrainian Business Journal, Alexandra Ustinova, who is a Ukrainian MP from the Holos Party, and Svetoslav Yurash, another Ukrainian MP from the Servant of the People Party. And uh, Mr. Yurash, now the questions in the reverse alphabetical order. It seems that the entire effort about the release of the prisoners or prisoners exchanged concentrated around the president and his office. What role still the party played? What role the parliament played? As you are reputed to be from the inner circle of president's advisors. Well, uh, because of the reputation, I can tell you that this was the presidential achievement in every way. Uh, it was exactly the fact that Mr. Zelensky, now the president, uh, called Mr. Putin and discussed with him two times this question. And uh, because of what they agreed on and the process they agreed on, we had this amazing achievement. The fact is that the coordination was entirely presidential achievement, and that's why I credited the man both in my social media and doing this now. So don't you feel that you and other MPs from the Servant of the People are being sort of put aside in uh, trying to solve urgent matters? I wouldn't say that at all. I mean, the fact is clear that this question was raised by many MPs and myself as well with the president. And the president knew that for us to talk with our constituencies, we need to have this achievement that we promised and we need it so badly. And the fact is that the president achieved this with this haste exactly because there were no other parts involved in the process, because this could be a direct and essentially two-sided conversation, not uh, what happens usually when too many sides are in engaged in the process, that is breakdown of the process. So. Mrs. Tineva, your faction is not exactly in the opposition to this servant of the people, but it's not a eye-to-eye uh, uh, -eye vision of the situation in the country as well. Do you feel that with such a majority and such a cohesion in the ranks of the servant of people, you have to play a role in the parliament at all? I wouldn't say so, because uh, we had been elected by people, by almost a million of people, and we do represent our voice. We clearly stated that uh, we will be supporting the bills that we think should be supported. We're not going to play that coalition just jumping around and yelling that uh, we're against everything, because there are a lot of the good bills that are trying to be passed to the parliament. The only thing we keep telling the servant of the people is do not break the parliamentary rules. And this is one of the 
key problems that we're facing right now because uh, passing almost 70 bills in a week is a very short period of time and we already see that it's, it can be a problem in the future because a lot of the bills are being changed within the last minute. You don't have a clue what you're voting for. And uh, also some of the bills come in a package so, for example, we were very supportive for National Anti-Corruption Bureau and the State Bureau of Investigation becoming the constitutional bodies, and we were clearly supporting this idea. But on the other side, we saw that the constitutional changes that we were supposed to vote in the same package was to allow the president of Ukraine to create any kind of regulator institutions or bodies in Ukraine, which is too much and cannot be called the checks and balances, especially when you have the full power belonging to the president in this country. So we, did, we were clearly asking to separate these two bills. Asking or demanding? Uh, well, ex well, we could not demand because the bill was already introduced. So we, were, we, we, were clear, we clearly stated that if you separate these two questions, we will clearly support the first one, but not the second. Unfortunately, it was still passed without the separation, and that's why we were not supporting. But on the other side, we were supporting, totally supporting the immunity, to release the immunity from the MPs, because that's what we promised to our voters, and that's what needed to be done. So, James Book, obviously you're following events in Ukraine closely, and uh, as I heard, you regard Ukraine as an economy. What sort of bills do you single out among the 70 that we have heard of? Andrei, it's huge. I was discussing earlier that it's comparable to Franklin Roosevelt's first 100 days from a libertarian free market point of view. Uh, start with the land market. When that's up and running starting next summer and over the next few years, that will be Europe's largest farmland market, 42 million hectares. Privatization, we're talking about the largest sale of state companies in a generation in Eastern Europe. And then you're talking about opening up roads, railroads, ports, airports to private investment in public-private partnerships. You're talking about legalizing gambling. Uh, you're talking about uh, freeing up uh, foreign exchange rules, liberalizing labor market. It's a huge, I, I consider it the largest uh, political change in Eastern Europe in our time. It's very exciting. And probably with a quite large sum of money. Where will the money go? from the privatization and all this kind of stuff? Yeah, it's very obvious to the people because the fact is this money will be paid to the people. Not to the servants employed. of the people. Servants of the people are paid by sellers. The whole country knows how much they account to. And uh, the fact is when you look at it, to the matters of liberalization, is the fact that Ukrainians will get jobs, will get increased in their salary because they're up, freeing up with so much money in Ukraine. And the fact is this state based industries, which are essentially a uh, drain, Ukrainian economy will finally be released into the economic wild, so to speak, to allow our country to truly progress in the, in the same fashion as the whole Western world is progressing it. Alexandra Ostinova, Svetoslav Irash, you're both MPs and you have not been able to enjoy MPs' immunity. Any fear because of this? Or as opposed to our former MPs, you had nothing to lose. Alexander. Well, frankly speaking, I was one of the activists who was standing in front of Verkhovna Rada uh, two years ago, but demanding. You were not an MP, right? I was not an MP, I was an activist, demanding from MP to release it to this immunity. Because, frankly speaking, what we saw in the last couple of years, and that's what made people be so angry about this immunity, is. People going into the parliament not to change the country, but to protect themselves from being arrested. We all clearly saw, uh, but unfortunately that's what it's happened true, because true. I remember all these cases ran by the National Anti-Corruption Bureau when we saw, literally saw MPs on TV how demanding money, saying how much you have to pay for certain things to be, uh, uh, to be voted in the parliament or to be done in the country. And that's why this anger and this uh, lack of trust to the parliament was was so massive, I would say, that it was clearly that that, that was the first bill that needed to be voted. If I, if I am afraid myself, I'm not. I actually had a few criminal investigations opened on me back by the previous, uh, I would say, not government, but people running the country because I had security service following me. I had all these, um, unfortunately... Are you uh, sure they are not following you now? 
Um, I'm not, but there is you nothing. You can never tell. You can never tell, but there is nothing to lose. I'm not afraid. I have nothing to hide. I understand that this can be, unfortunately, one of the instrument to keep the power in the country, especially, and to keep the coalition, the, the mono coalition that we have right now. And I hope this instrument will not, will never be used in this way. But that was the demand of people, and we had to do that. And I think the majority of, of people right now in the parliament are not the people who went there to actually escape from the prison. People who went there right now, the majority of these young faces, are people who want to change the country. And there is nothing to be afraid of and nothing to hide. Mr. Irash, critics of the servant of the people would say that while removing the MPs immunity, you still kept the president's immunity intact. Why so? Well, we essentially promised to strip all of the immunity that exists in Ukraine all for promises. all servants. Well, again, it's a, it's a start of the process because stripping the immunity is not just in its own package. The reality is we are doing that as well as reforming our law enforcement, which is key to avoiding the risks you mentioned, the risks of political prosecution, corrupt uh, deals that done by law enforcement as we know in Ukrainian history. Uh, the fact is this is, is an entire package in which presidential immunity will be included. But the question is that we are starting with this because everybody that is in the parliament, except for one understandable party, promised this exactly to the people. Na name this party, not everybody well, knows. Mr. Medvedchuk's party, the Full Life Party, which essentially when we went around Ukraine to tell of our message, of our ideas, of our steps to change the country, they went to Moscow. Basically, it's a different campaign, I guess, they were running. And it's very sad to me that we weren't able to convince mostly Donbass to not vote for this power. We hope to change that coming to the local elections happening soon. James Rook, a bit about American practices of uh, MPs or senators or Congress representatives immunity, uh, also in comparison with uh, what your president has to go through. We know about impeachment processes or attempts in the US. Yeah, well impeachment is a political trial, so you need a majority in Congress, uh, I believe in the House, to get the indictment and the majority in the Senate to get the conviction. But we lose uh, congressmen and women from time to time uh, because they've gotten too full of themselves. They start taking money and golf course trips and this sort of thing. Um, so you always have to keep your guard up. And you do lose uh, you know, one, two a year maybe. Uh, and that's healthy. That, that's good because you need a reality check. You, you need uh, crime and punishment. You need the consequences. And, and I think that's there. And what about pride and prejudice? Well, let's, <laughs> we have a lot of pride in the in the White House today, <laughs> and a lot of prejudice too. But that's the, a different story. The very names, servant of the people and Holos, which means voice, do not suggest any pride. What do they suggest? Maybe some people watching the Sunday Show see the representatives of those parties for the first time, briefly. What do you mean when you call yourself servant of the people? And then Alexandra Ustinova. We mean that the Ukrainians always wanted in their members of parliament the fact that they would serve not only themselves, but the Ukrainian nation as a whole. And the fact for us is very clear. Please define the Ukrainian nation. Ukrainian nation, people living in Ukraine, citizens of Ukraine. All right. Holos or voice or ballot in this case. <clears throat> Well, I would say the voice because uh, we've always, so when we went to the parliament, we told our voters that we would be their voice inside the parliament. And that's why we have been going, we, we went out a lot just talking to people just to realize what the demands are, what do people want to see, how they want to see the country in the nearest five years. And we see ourselves as a constructive voice inside the parliament. Unfortunately, we're not a coalition, but we have, I would say probably, excuse me, the most professional uh, people in the parliament because we have people coming from McKinsey. We have people coming from the best law uh, firms in Ukraine. And we would be those who would be representing the voice of people and trying to focus the coalition and frame the coalition to go into the right direction and professional direction, not just going into populism sometimes. Are you satisfied with how the cabinet of ministers started to work? Have you or any of the people you know within the circle of the president advised this restructuring of the cabinet of ministers? Or this is the initiative of the new prime minister? 
I mean, some mergers of ministries and uh, some changes in the functions. I mean, let's talk about the structure first. The structure was discussed throughout the presidential campaign. Basically, these videos Zelensky made with experts were all about restructuring the government of the executive in general to make it more effective. Second, the fact that the uh, this reality that we have in Ukraine now of cabinet ministers not being comprised of various parties, essentially putting their people in front, but essentially one executive body that can function effectively is a surprise and very welcome one. And thirdly, Mr. Goncharuk, who I met over the years and who is very well known in civil society, is an example of actually how this cabinet ministers is a triumph of civil society. And essentially, Mr. Goncharuk will prove it to be. So, Ms. Ustino, how do you consider whether the uh, distribution of... Uh, uh, places or seats in the parliamentary committees was just? Well, let's be honest. We have one party who took the full responsibility for what they're doing in the country. They have their cabinet of ministers, they're running the majority. Are you ready to surrender the full responsibility to them? Uh, there is nothing we can do about it. This is the first time in the country when you have one party running everything in this country, the government, the parliament, uh, the committees in the parliament and having their own president. Uh, we can suggest, we can propose, we can demand. But right now, they are the ones who are holding the responsibility. Talking, for example, about the cabinet of ministers, I think this is one of the best cabinet of ministers we've seen so far. Very professional, young faces, people who used to work for a lot of... Uh, international companies, people who know what the government is. For example, Alexei Hancharuk used to run BRD, which was like the back office for all the reforms for Groisman government. But unfortunately, and again, I keep coming back to this package voting. We see some people in this government that I would never want to see ever back in in the, not even in the government, but in any kind of structure in this country. Because we can see, for example, the former minister of the internal affairs, Unfortunately, let's be honest, the police reform had failed in, in the country. That's why it was very weird for me to see this person in the new government who considered themselves to be technocrats. But maybe the police reform has uh, failed so far. And uh, one of the reasons was that the president was not right. Or we did not have the right president. Now with Mr. Zelensky, Mr. Avakov, who is the interior minister, will work better. Frankly speaking, I... I don't like this Ukrainian tradition to blame somebody, but not taking the responsibility. Let's be honest, Arsen Avakov came from one of the biggest party who was in the coalition. And reforming the police was totally his responsibility and the uh, parliamentary responsibility for passing the bills. And his party was one of the coalition members. So to blame the president for failing the reform, the, the police reform is very strange. We can blame the president, the former president, for not reforming the security service, for example, because he, he could have done that, but not for the police reform. That's why I'm looking forward to see what will be done right now in the police, uh, what would be the reforms that are going to be there, because what I see so far is just changing the names for the departments, and that's not the reform, and that's what the previous government and the previous uh, president was trying to do. And I'm also looking forward for the security service reform because I totally agree with my colleague that the law enforcement is the immune system of this country. If we do not reboot it, if we do not restart it, all the other reforms are going to fail. And that's exactly what happened for the last five years. Ms. Ustineva says that the servant of the people allegedly controls everything in the country. In fact, this is not so. For instance, the party does not have control of the capital. And this is one of the points of contention now, because in Kiev, the mayor, Vitaly Klitschko, also has the position of the head, so far, has the position of the head of the city-state administration. The cabinet of ministers has already suggested that he leaves the position. The president, as far as I know, still has not signed this decree. Why it is important for the servant of the people to remove Mr. Klitschko from this position? 
Well, from the conversation I've had with my colleagues who are experts in local administration, the reality of Kiev is that it, des it is desperately in need of the law that regulates how Kiev is governed. It is a unique city in the sense that it has both the executive function, which is appointed by the president, and the elected function of a mayor, which usually were combined but sometimes separated, and that isn't how it should be in many ways. Either it should be completely elected or completely appointed, but basically there needs to be a law on Kiev. So Mr. Klitschko finds himself in a very peculiar position, Indeed, uh, but he doesn't just, he's not a fresh face. I mean, he has five years of record to look back to, and that record, thanks to your colleagues, journalists, is very pointedly full of corruption and problems with spending and uh, mismanagement of many, many things. Uh, the reality is that what we point to as his faults are just a reflection of what civil society and journalism have been saying for years. And with local elections coming up, it is very clearly a uh, demand of times that are showing change in every other part of Ukrainian state, change of mayors, of Mr. Klitschko as well too. Well, Kyiv may be a unique city where legality is concerned, but in practice it is not so unique. Because in Ukrainian regions, the uh, state administration, regional state administration, whose heads are appointed by the president, are usually much more powerful than the elected regional councils. And many people would say that the desire to separate the positions of the head of the regional or city administration in this case and the mayor is another attempt to put the situation in Kyiv under the control of the president, of the executive branch. So the question is, when will we, if ever, come to the realization that elected representatives are more important than the appointed ones, Ms. Ustinova. Well, we have been living in, in this kind of political system for a long time. And let's be honest, there, there had always been checks and balances. And a lot of people have been telling about going back to the presidential parliamentary republic, but I don't think that's the point right now. Um, and I think right now, the parliament forming the government is exactly somebody taking the responsibility for what is going on in the country and the parliamentarians are being elected. So some of them are even leaving the parliament to go into the government. That's what happened in the surrender of the people. So I don't think that's the problem right now. But talking about the uh, g uh, coming back to Klitschko case, um, I think this is more a political decision than the uh, regulatory one, because we have seen for the last week that it's not about the regulatory issues, it's about the political decision, because if you want, you can change the, the law uh, by 226 votes in five minutes, having the Mona coalition. Uh, I would not say I'm very supportive for such political decisions because we do still have Pippin bill elected. Yes, the bill on Kyiv has to be, and on the local governments do have to be, uh, has to be passed through the parliament. But I would say we need to pass the bill first and then start the uh, re-elections. Because right now we see the political decisions coming before even the bill being introduced into the parliament. And that's, this is the problem because it clearly states that we can change anything we want we can declare it even before introducing it into the parliament. And I think this is a problem, but I do agree with my colleague that we do need to change the bill on that. One of the biggest uh, points of uh, dissatisfaction of uh, the so-called ordinary or common people about the previous parliament was that lots of talk, lots of uh, hot air, and uh, mm, very little done. And also the level of discussion, mutual accusations, ungrounded, unfounded, and so on and so forth. My question is to James Brook now. Have you noticed any kind of uh, change in the way the things are discussed in the Ukrainian parliament and the Ukrainian political milieu since the new people came to power? Very good question. Just to back up a little bit about the regional governors, my impression is that under decentralization, the uh, mayors have become quite powerful. And I remember Zubko, the Minister of Regional Development, would often meet maybe once every six months with 700 mayors. And it was a clear attempt to make sure they would deliver votes for Poroshenko. It, it didn't happen, but uh, he was identifying that under decentralization, the money is going out to the mayors. Uh, I think what you're going to see here in um, Ukraine, the Rada, is sort of a 
maybe a Lee Kuan Yew uh, <laughs> temporary authoritarian express democracy where stuff's going to be, it's like McDonald's, you may pass through the drive-by window pretty fast. Uh, and as uh, Sasha said, maybe not with the, uh, probably not with adequate debate, uh, but you will get a lot of results. And uh, sometimes it can be therapeutic for a government to just get stuff done and then slow down and, and maybe reevaluate. But I, I think we're entering into sort of a express democracy phase. Mr. Rush, where do you expect the strongest resistance where the plans of the servant of the people are concerned? Well, as always, it's the Moscow question. Russia has many instruments in our conversations, and they essentially control the second largest party in the parliament. And for us, it's clear that it's still a two-way street. The fact that Ukrainian reforms are successful depends on whether Russia is not willing to intervene more heavily in Ukraine, both war-wise and politi politically speaking. So it all depends on the dialogue that Mr. Zelensky and Mr. Putin have had so far successfully. And we are back to uh, Natalia Humenyuk, who is in Moscow now following how Russian local elections unfold. What are the major issues that Russians discuss while deciding whom to vote for? So um, now at this stage, nobody could imagine still that these elections would matter. This is Moscow City Council elections. However, what we know, what happened, that the election commission didn't let uh, none of the independent candidates, 39 of them, to be registered, which uh, had been followed by the huge protest, the biggest protest since the 2012, which were lasting every Saturday here in Moscow for uh, the, uh, July and August. Today are the elections, so there are no uh, independent candidates registered, uh, and there is a very, very low turnout. Uh, however, and I'm, but it's quite a weird feeling because at every um, station, polling station like this I am, there is quite a music, uh, like, kitchen, people are eating something, there is a flower festival, very, very little people, very few people are coming, but there is an intrigue. It, uh, the opposition uh, leader, Navalny, announced so-called smart um, vote. The smart vote means that he encourages the people to vote to anybody apart from Yedina Rasiya, the United Russia, or the, the most important uh, let's say, the only real party in, in Russia apart from the communists. Uh, so there is still the intrigue. Uh, all the other candidates who are not, uh, they are not uh, announced to be from the uh, United Russia because just being close to this to party uh, already means that you would lose this, uh, the rating. Um, that was one of the reasons why the independent candidates were not allowed because the early polls showed that anybody who is not from United Russia uh, will get it. So everybody from the government are running as if they are independent. Uh, this is not the case. But Navalny calls to, uh, to vote for the others, and they are mainly communists. So the intrigue is there. If the communists win, uh, that means uh, that could be announced as if this is a victory of the opposition. Uh, so there are expectations of the falsification. There are of the, some kind of uh, wrongdoings. Uh, but that would be uh, there just during the, uh, the night. Uh, that's something to follow. So generally, the atmosphere is very, very calm. However, the um, things could happen. And I really talked to quite a few, uh, the leaders of the protest, unregistered candidates and other, other people. They really don't know what would be the reaction of the population uh, because uh, in this case, there are no one, no leaders. The, 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 but, but the people, so, so this is something to follow. This is still not the end. And even if won't be the a street protest like tomorrow or something in case of something, um, that would lead to some political, uh, new political process. I'm pretty sure that Natalia Humanyuk will duly, duly report on what happens in Moscow and uh, in Russia in general after the election comes to close. And my last question is concerning what Mr. Yurash has just said. Where do we get additional support if we do need it? Who starts? Alexandra Ostino. Uh, 
Could you please specify what kind of additional support? I mean, I about? asked uh, about the strongest resistance that we may encounter. Svetoslav answered, and uh, obviously we need some additional means to combat this resistance. Where do we well, get it? Inside, outside, well, where? Inside, I can total. I, I can say that Holos will totally be supportive on all the resistance to Moscow, and this is we had always been clearly stating that. This, any kind of coalition or, I don't know, even interaction with Moscow is the red lines with us. Unfortunately, we have to be strong on that. And if we talk again about the external support, uh, I think internally the Ukrainian nation, the Ukrainian people had literally, uh, had already clearly stated they're totally supporting pro-European movement and they are, they're not supporting any kind of pro-Russian even statements. Even if the second largest party in the parliament is pro-Russian? Uh, well, if you see the number of the people in the second largest party, they're not representing even uh, even a large number of people. So if, we look, if you look at the servant of the people, you look at Holos, you look at uh, uh, Poroshenko party and Timoshenko party, this is the majority and this is the pro-European uh, and Ukrainian majority. So uh, I would not manipulate on that. But talking about the external support, we do have to collaborate closely with our international partners because this had been the biggest, the United States, the European Union, had been always the biggest allies for Ukraine in, within not even the last five years, but even before that. And we still, and we do have to keep that. We have to, I would say, even make the, strong, uh, the stronger um, connections. And we have to work with the US uh, Senate on sanctions. Alexander, your gesture and then your look towards an American in our studio was so eloquent that I have to ask him as well, how justified are those hopes that Ukrainian no. spin on the U.S. I think the U.S. support for Ukraine is very solid. It's bizarre because the man at the top, Trump, is kind of wobbly and weak-kneed. We think that maybe Mr. Putin has some stuff on Trump, <laughs> financial otherwise. Uh, but underneath, the Congress is solidly pro-Ukraine. We just had two senators here the other day. Uh, and the deep state, you know, the bureaucracy, the state, the Pentagon, solidly pro-Ukraine. Part of that is solidarity with uh, a fellow free market democracy. And part of that, frankly, is a way to stick it to the Russians. So, you know, so that has a, a big, after the debacle of the presidential election of several years ago, that has a big appeal, a cross-party appeal, bipartisan appeal. Thank you, James Brooks. Thank you, Alexander Ustinova. Thank you, Svetoslav Yurash. Uh, follow us on uh, social networks and social media. Uh, you may make a donation towards the development of uh, romatske.ua and we will be back with you shortly.